uh, I'd like to begin by thanking the organizers for considering me worthy of being invited. I would also like to thank uh, Lai Meng for having done a considerable part of the work that I wanted to see. Uh, she's done it so much better, but since they are my slide, I will still say it all the same. Um, I thought that after listening to these two very wonderful presentations on the global issues of access to health, it might be a useful thing to look at one small aspect of the world as a paradigm of what is happening in some of the places that are lesser known. My name is Fola Esong. It's a shortened form of a very long name. So if you type that onto the Google or anything, it won't show up because uh, it's so difficult to write. So this is so much easier to talk about. I'm a fellow of the Nigerian Academy of Science. I chair the Health Sciences Committee, which was inaugurated only about two or three years ago. And I also serve on the IAMP Executive Committee. Basically, I trained as a hematologist and retired many years ago. Or well, five years ago, I was targeted and asked to come to Ekiti State University. That's another name you will never have heard about, uh, to come and start a medical school. That's my background. Now, a lot of people hear about Africa, but most people think Africa is just a little village somewhere. It's a very diverse continent with lots of uh, people. And where I come from, it's called Nigeria. It's that little corner there. And it's shown in the next slide. Nigeria is even more complex than Africa. There are probably more than 320 languages in that society of a population said to be about 170 million now. Plus or minus whatever figure we don't know because these are guesstimates. And Ekiti State is somewhere here. Abuja is somewhere here. And that's Lagos. Lagos and Abuja are the places that you hear about. But like I was telling somebody yesterday, they do not represent Nigeria. The capital of Ikiti State is called Adu Ikiti. I'm lucky to have lived there because I went to secondary school there, so I know the place fairly well. And I believe it represents what most Nigeria is all about. My talk will be on the ideas that the Academy of Science is trying to put to Nigeria as a means of helping them to develop universal access to health. I will probably omit the definitions that I've tried to put here. Um, lots of people do not have health services. Everybody knows that. And those who use it, they are pushed below the poverty limit because they have to pay out of pocket. And this is the reason why we need to have universal health access and health coverage. And there is a need for a certain number of people to be able to make sure that this access is provided. So we need to train more people. If you, I may refer you to the slide of uh, Professor Lai Meng, Africa has a very big disease burden and has a very small population of people who are looking after this disease burden. Much more importantly, as we train these people, they escape to other uh, places. And at the last count, we found that there were more Nigerian doctors in the, in the United States than there are in Nigeria. Because as we train them, they go away. Now, uh, Lime said there are two um, dimensions to access. I've made it three. You have to have physical accessibility. You have to be financially it has to be financially affordable, and then it has to be accepted by the population that you are dealing with. Now, if you say, what do we mean by physical accessibility, I'll give you an example. My government in Ekiti State wanted to build a primary health center, and there was a big quarrel between two towns. 
This two towns have a distance of about three kilometers in between them. And they could not agree, so it was sighted in the middle of the bush, in between the two, halfway in between. Nobody lives near, and so most of the time, it is closed because nobody is able to come there, even though there is a big road that passes in front of the place. So there are problems which you may not be familiar with, but these are very important in the areas of need. The services that are available must be relevant to the diseases that you are going to be treating. I once applied for a research grant from a, um, an organization that I ended up heading. I had applied for a research grant to do an epidemiological survey of sickle cell disease, which affects about 2% of our population. I was told that this was not very good research. All the money went into those who wanted to do some native medicines and other things to see whether there were new drugs to be used for cancer. And so I got no money. Whereas the proportion of cancer at that time was much less than sickle cell disease, but it was considered a lot more important and it is much better research. Now, I think it is the issue of financial affordability that is really most important. Um, it is not just the cost of out-of-pocket out expenses when you are treated. The cost of getting there and getting back and all the rest of the people who have to come and look after you if you get admitted to a hospital. All of this can be very crippling. Now, most countries have settled for some form of health insurance, and this is what the Nigerian government has also decided to do. And some research at home has shown that if you have a form of health insurance, you can reduce your cost by, by as much as 40%, even in experimental conditions. It has also been changed decided as to what do we really want. Is it universal coverage or universal access? Clearly, it is not possible to have universal coverage if you do not have universal access. So I will be talking more about universal coverage as it affects the Nigerian population, that we are competing with faith-based organizations, especially the traditional ones who will just come out and say, we have a cure for this disease that they've never had, they've never seen before. A recent case in point is when we had the first case of Ebola in Nigeria. A number of people came up and said, oh, we've seen this disease before, we can cure it. Some suggested that bathing with hot, salted water will cure Ebola. The newspapers grabbed at it, and everybody was buying salt and washing with uh, uh, essentially saline. Now, those who had renal disease found themselves overloaded with salt, as those who have hypertension, and we got more deaths from people drinking salt water or washing with salt water than the total number of deaths that we had with Ebola on the final analysis. Somebody will wake up one day and say that, I have discovered a herb. I was sleeping, and my father appeared to me in the dream, and he said, go and use such and such a, a, a drug. It's going to cure this disease. And somehow, a lot of people would believe that. I have a colleague who retired as a professor of agri-economics. But before that, he had studied botany. And now he's a better practitioner than I am. I once went to see my tailor who had a prostatectomy in the very good hospital, which he abandoned and then became a client of this, my friend. And he was telling me that he's now found a wonderful doctor who will cure everything. So we live in this unscientific, unscientific community. So there are competitions. So it is not enough to provide a thing. If the people believe that it's not going to deliver, and they do not accept it, it will not be used. Uh, 
that's not relevant. Um, I think I'll skip this because it's been turned over by the other people. Question of equity. Now, how do we provide the health statistics and information systems that are critical for the public health initiatives that we call universal health, and health uh, access? The health system delivery ought to be people-centered and people-oriented, and it should be integrated. As it is now, there are disparities and problems. Our health system is organized in three tiers. They call it the primary, the secondary, and the tertiary. But the fact is that there is a seamless transition from one to the other. A place that is supposed to be doing primary health care may not have access, sufficient access to the secondary. And so it takes on much better, much higher things than it's supposed to do. And the people who are supposed to be doing secondary care are swarmed by people who are essentially primary care people, so primary care problems, and therefore those who are supposed to be doing secondary care have no time to do the thing that they are supposed to do. The same goes for the tertiary care hospitals. So what is the answer? Uh, this I can skip. We have mentioned the question of the number of uh, well-trained staff that is needed. And this is sorely needed in very many places in Africa, certainly in Nigeria. And this is what has led to a proliferation and an increase in the number of medical schools that have been uh, set up, of which mine is one of them. The problem of that is that there are not sufficient number of teachers. So the quality of training tends to go down simply because of non-availability of the first, uh, things that are supposed to be used. When I was appointed provost, I gave an undertaking to the first set of students that I hope that the college will be accredited on time. That is, after the first two years, we'll be accredited for the first time. Two years later, we'll get a second accreditation, and two years later, a final. A final. What I did not know at that time was there were no funds in the coffers of the government to be able to prosecute this project. So when we got to the point of asking the accreditors to come, we had not done more than two-thirds of what we were supposed to do. So we got stuck. And so we have these kind of problems all over the place. However, there is some streak of goodness. Uh, in 1999, just before the military handed over to the civilians in my country, they promulgated a decree which they hoped was going to set up what has now been called a National Health Insurance Scheme. All the acts and decrees that were passed by the military were now designated as acts of parliament so that they cannot be repealed just easily, as easily as they were set up. The idea was that this scheme will determine the overall policies that is going to be used for. It will ensure their effective implementation. And I want to emphasize this, they will periodically do research, consultancy, and training programs for the scheme. Arrange for financial and medical audit. Set guidelines for effective cooperation. Ensure public awareness of the scheme and do all other matters that they think may be relevant to make the system work. I don't think you will have a more laudable idea for what needs to be done. Now, the whole idea, the objective was that every Nigerian should have access to good health care services. They should protect the families from financial hardship and limit the rise in health care costs and ensure equitable distribution of costs, some kind of equity. Maintain high standards of efficiency and improve and harness the private sector. Now, the first set of people were admitted. Yeah, 
the distribution of healthcare should be equitable between the eight various parts of the country. Now, we have a terrible division in our country in which the north is much, much poorer than the southern parts of the country. And the whole idea of this is that the distribution should be equitable and then to try and find funds for the system. The system was supposed to be organized so that there will be health management organizations who will now employ the health care givers, the health care facilities. And these facilities and organizations have to be registered by the scheme. They will determine the capitation fees that should be paid. They will advise on other forms of social security services and ensure that they pay the salaries of the staff and other ancillaries. Now, this is quite easy to write. How do we predict how much money it will need in three or four years' time? And as been said before, the cost of health care goes up the more of it is used. More diseases are diagnosed. The care of people with previously untreated diseases will become very expensive. The pharmaceutical companies will demand and generate new diseases that will allow them to sell their drugs at very, expen very expensively. So this is part of the problem. Now I took the NHIS three or four years to come up with this definition of what their vision is. What I'm trying to say here is that even though the staff were employed, they wasted considerable amount of time doing things which may be very useful, but will have been done in a much shorter time. So they were debating whether they were going to have a mission or a vision for two, three years, and they came up with this. There's nothing really fundamental about this that it will have taken two, three years. And then they went on to talk about the mission. All of these are written in rather convoluted language. I think if I was the original director, I would just have stuck with the objectives and the initiatives that was initially stated in the act. However, what have been the activities of this NHI system? Well, they developed a 140-page operational guidelines which trying to read will make you sick. But basically what it says is that there is going to be a package that will be delivered to the subscribers of this scheme at primary, at secondary, and at tertiary level. They will pay so much for these services. These monies will be given to the HMOs. The HMOs will now fund the healthcare facilities they will keep records and such other matters that will enable an audit to be done. What they have not done is the modality of how research is going to be conducted. It is so easy to present an auditor report of accounts at the end of every year. It is not so easy to ask a research organization to come and audit your services. And most organizations, especially in our situation, shy away from this kind of thing because they do not want to be seen to be inadequate or they are not, they're somewhat impervious to change. They want to go on on the same way over and over and over again, making the same mistakes. They now had, by the end of September 2013, from 1999, they only had 5.2 million enrollees in this scheme. And of this, more than half of them were federal government uh, employees. Now, Nigeria is organized, has a three-tier set of governors. There is a local government, there is a state government, and then there is a federal government. The federal government has a lot more money, takes about 52% of the money. The states take about 30-something, and the rest goes to the uh, local governments. These 2.5 million were the upper echelons of the federal government, not even the lower ones. There was only one state that was registered with this scheme because there is a competition 
and sometimes an antagonism between state and federal government. The states do not want to take a dictation from the federal, and the federal does not want to cooperate with the states. Sometimes they withhold their money. But at least a start was made, and 5.2 million employees were listed by the end of September 2013. At that time, there was a change in leadership. Uh, the first director was kind of handpicked by political mentors. This time around, they had an advertisement. They hired consultants who actually screened and interviewed these people. And they appointed somebody on the basis of the interview and the recommendation of the consultants. Now, the action since then has been that one year later, the numbers have increased to 7.4 million. Uh, there is an additional group of 24 million school children that have been processed that will join the group by the beginning of the school year in January, which is very close by. They are experimenting with a mobile enrollment scheme. Now, one of the so-called modern revolutions in Nigeria, which happened about 10, 12 years ago, was introduction of the mobile telephone. You can transfer your money now on the mobile telephone. You can send for antenatal clinics and that kind of stuff. You can register with your doctor. And now the insurance companies, the NHIS, is beginning to say, you don't have to come to us. If you just have a mobile phone, there will be a scheme whereby we can register you so as to increase, and then you can access the facilities also by mobile phone, which is a very good one. They are operating a tertiary students, a tertiary education students program. Now, the standard thing is that when you have a university or a college of education or that kind of thing, you have to set up your own health system, employ a doctor, several nurses, hire a clinic and all that kind of thing, operating a, a whole gamut of things. With this system, the burden on the school will be a lot less. It will be shifted onto the national health system. It will not abolish the health system, the uh, doctors that are resident within the campuses of these universities, but they will transfer to the primary health care systems that are closest to them and the tertiary, the primary and secondary, secondary and tertiary uh, hospitals that are also there. Much more importantly, this new leadership has been able to convince 20 out of the 36 states to start operating the system again by January. So we expect that the numbers of people who will be in the scheme will dramatically increase during the forthcoming year. No. What are the challenges that we see? I have mentioned the problem of alternative practitioners. In the, uh, some call them complementary people. I am not personally opposed to other uh, traditional recognized non-university uh, uh, practitioners people who are trained maybe in India or in China in some form of traditional medicines where there's a cost of organization. But when the Minister of Health out of the blue says that the universities should now begin to train traditional doctors and give them university degrees so they can be uh, um, registered, you, you just wonder what is happening. Uh, just as the person who employed the last set of people who are now running the system, in swearing them in and giving them the certificate of their job, said, I want you to raise the number of people to, I uh, hear it's about 10% now, I want you in four years to raise it to 30%. And when I speak to this executive director, I say, 30% of what? 10% of what? People just give information or directives out of the heart. No evidence. Nothing to back up what is being said. 
when a federal minister of health, who himself is a doctor, wakes up in a conference of traditional health practitioners and says, oh, I'm going to instruct the university so that you can now go to university now. You get a BSc or whatever, and then we'll put you on the register. You'll be able to do the work like the other doctors do. It calls for a lot of thinking and uh, trying to see how things ought to be done. The question of the funding, right now, most of the funding is still being provided by the federal government. But as the capitation fees are paid, uh, as the enrollees pay their fees for enrolling, then it is expected that there will be a build-up of a lot of money which can then flow back into the system. But we all know that it will never be enough to ask the people through capitation. I like to com combine this with the issue of insurance. Our people are very averse to paying for expected problems in the future. Nobody believes that there is a need, although they believe in saving for the raining day, <coughs> excuse me, they do not believe that you should pay ahead of the trouble that may uh, happen to you. And in fact, the name that is given to insurance in my own language is derogatory. That you are asking me to pay so that you can pay me when I sustain a loss. That means that you are praying that I should sustain a loss. Who are you? Are you God? So the question of, you have to orient people to say that by pulling resources, then you have a system whereby nobody is going to lose in the end. Even what is mandatory to say that you have to insure a third party, your car, because of the possibility that you may have an accident involving some other person who may need to make a claim or go to hospital. Lots of our people try as much as possible to avoid this kind of system. There is no scientific base for the people to be able to think in terms of all of these things that we are seeing. We live in a pre-science age. So there is a need to educate the people to be able to make the system work. If somebody has malaria and will refuse to take a test on it and will rather go and kneel before a priest, either of the native system or of the traditional religions, and hope that faith will heal him, then you can see the problems that we are getting. As for social inequities, I think this has been referred to, it is extremely high in our society. We got the lowest people on earth, people who are living on less than one dollar a day, and we have some of the richest people on earth as well. The income gap is becoming wider and wider with a lot of people at the bottom and only a very small group at the top. In fact, it was recently said that of all the loans that have been bandied around in Nigeria, only 39 people are responsible for 70% of all the loans that are given by the banks. Now, we have several billionaires and, of course, lots and lots of people who have no money at all. And what is more, there is bad governance. Uh, recently, there was a hue and cry about a governor who, in preparation for his retirement, asked the state government, the state parliament, to pass a law that will pay him 100 million naira every year until he dies for medical expenses only. For a 48-year-old man who's going to retire at the age of 50, he doesn't need that money. And yet, the hospital or primary health center, just two streets away from his mansion, may have no aspirin to be able to use. And yet, he will get... That's the level of the discrepancy and the social inequities. What can we do this? I said something about policy consistency or lack of it. This is what I mean. 
the minister of health who is supposed to regulate and foster this kind of thing is the one who is also saying, I want to educate, in quotes, the traditional healers and make them at par with the scientific healers. So there's no consistency. Uh, just to tell you the kind of thing that we compete with, I don't know whether you can read this very clearly, what it says. It says, in very large letters, Ebenezer Dental Clinic. Now, all of you, if you saw that, you will think that that's the place you will go to if you have problem with your teeth. But what do you have underneath it? Menstrual pain, fibroid, stomach, uh, stomach ache, stomach trouble, cough, chest pain, asthma. Now, this is a signboard of a traditional healer. And there are lots and lots like this all over the place. You will see them in Ghana. You will see them in, in uh, Benin Republic. Uh, those are the areas I'm familiar with. I'm almost certain you'll find them in East Africa as well. Now, how has the Nigerian Academy of Science come into this situation? Because after all, this is a program of science for health. And as I mentioned before, I came here on the ages of the Nigerian Academy of Science and I chair the health sciences system. First, we are trying to foster a science-based culture by writing papers for schools and giving them symposia, educational visits, and things like that. We formed a forum on evidence-based health policy making. We meet, select a topic two or three times a year, we debate it, produce a program, and then give this to government. I think like many other science academies, very often these reports are just received with a lot of respect. They are kept under the shelf, and at the end of the study, maybe nothing is done, but occasionally something gets done. We did a study, for example, on how to reduce maternal and child health in Nigeria, which was funded in part by the IAMP. This was submitted to government. <coughs> the IAMP thought it was a very good thing, and I think that is partially being implemented. On the other hand, we were asked to look into the um, research units of various government institutions by the Minister of Science and Technology. There were many of them with overlapping uh, uh, mandates. They were worried as to how much of their money was being utilized for the core values that they were supposed to be pursuing. And we did what we thought was a very good job, submitted this report with a lot of uh, fanfare to the minister. Two weeks later, the minister was relieved of his duties. He went back to his uh, teaching as a university professor. When we approached his uh, successor, he told us point blank that that was not his priority and nothing has been done about it. But this will not deter us, we continue. <laughs> we award prizes, we participate in youth programs, we actually cooperate in doing some operational research with some of the states. We have not been lucky in the choice of our states because the two states that we are working with now happen to be anti-federal government and they have problems of succession. <coughs> We do preparation and dissemination of statements just like the IAMP does. Well, what is universal access? It's ensure when all people, irrespective of social or economic status, are able to access health services at all times and financial risk protection systems are accessible affordable and acceptable. Thus, universal access to health makes universal health coverage an attainable goal. 
And this is a quotation from Dr. Margaret Chan, who, as WHODG, said that he regarded universal health coverage as the single most powerful concept that public health has to offer. It is inclusive, it unifies services and delivers them in a comprehensive and integrated way based on primary health care. I hope we can achieve that in Nigeria. I hope a lot of people in Africa and other areas with that big budget will be able to copy what is being done in the developed world and achieve universal health care. That's my important uh, notice board again. And uh, I thank you.